In April 2022, Crawley Town was taken over by Wagme United, a group of 28 cryptocurrency and NFT investors, led by so-called crypto bros Preston Johnson and Evan Smith, promising to take the League 2 team all the way up to the Premier League. The name of the ownership group, WAGME, stands for We're All Gonna Make It, a popular catchphrase within the cryptocurrency community and in crypto-related meme culture, which actually dates back to a bodybuilder and fitness influencer who died of a heart attack at the age of 22. WAGME described themselves as the internet team and outlined their bold ambitions to recruit fans not just from Crawley's traditional fan base in West Sussex, but from every corner of the globe with an internet connection, funding Crawley's rise through the sale of NFTs, which would allow fans the opportunity to vote on key aspects of how the club is run. One of the 28 investors, Hunter Oral stated that, quote, Without a doubt, Crawley would reach the Premier League. On Wagme's website, the company's mission statement reads, quote, Wagme United is dedicated to bringing Web3's most innovative ideas and passionate communities to the world of sports. In early 2022, we bought Crawley Town FC, an English Football League 2 club. Together, we're going to take Crawley Town to the Premier League. End quote. What could possibly go wrong? Well, as it turns out, quite a lot. Two weeks after Wagme arrived, Crawley Town's manager John Yems became embroiled in the biggest racism scandal to rock British football in a generation and was suspended by the club. Over the next eight months, Crawley went through six different managers. Two months after Wagme arrived, the cryptocurrency market crashed and NFTs all but collapsed, as many fortunes were wiped out, even quicker than they had been amassed. A rotten end to the 2021-22 season for Crawley was followed by a catastrophic start to 2022-23, and the Red Devils only ended up avoiding relegation last season by a mere three points. Within the space of 12 months then, the promise of Premier League football had turned to finishing 90th out of English football's 92 Premier League and EFL clubs, and coming within inches of returning to the non-league game for the first time in 12 years. If nothing else, it would be fair to say that it has been eventful, and we have barely scratched the surface just yet. So in today's video, I invite you all to sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to Crawley via the Metaverse and Web3, of course, as we take a look at quite possibly the most chaotic club in the EFL, and believe me, there is some formidable competition, their big ideas, bizarro crypto bro owners, and whether Crawley Town are destined for Premier League football as hoped, or to crash harder than the crypto market under them over the next few years. It is easy to point fingers at Crawley Town's new owners and a lot of the mistakes that they have made since acquiring the club. And rest assured, that is exactly what I'm going to do. But it is worth just pointing out that chaos and tumult isn't exactly new for the club. In fact, for at least the last 30 years, it has pretty much been the norm. Founded as Crawley Football Club over 125 years ago, when Queen Victoria was still on the throne, Crawley were actually disbanded in 1934, and the club ceased to exist before being reformed following a three-year hiatus. In 1958, 11 years after Crawley was designated as a new town, the club was renamed Crawley Town. During the same year, Gatwick Airport opened on the outskirts of the town, promising to bring economic prosperity. And four years later, in 1962, Crawley Town turned semi-professional and joined the Southern League at step eight of the English Football League pyramid. In 1999, just two years after moving into the council-owned Broadfield Stadium, and though they were still semi-professional, Crawley entered administration with £400,000 worth of debt. Nonetheless, they bounced back and reached the conference, since renamed the National League, for the first time in 2004. The following season, a 12th place finish made Crawley the highest ranked part-time team in English football, and in the summer of 2005, Crawley were acquired by brothers Chaz and Mohamed Aswar Majid, who took the decision to go full-time and turn professional, for the first time in the 109-year history of the club. 
It didn't take long for the proverbial to hit the fan. By March of the following season, in light of an early FA Cup exit and dwindling attendances, Crawley looked to slash their wage bill by 50% and put their entire squad up for sale. Before long, they were back in administration, this time with debts of £1.4 million. The Majid brothers, who owned the club meanwhile, claimed that they were owed £700,000 themselves. The brothers' attempt to take Crawley out of administration was rejected by three votes to one, and with no other offers on the table, it was announced that the club would be liquidated. At the 11th hour though, creditors reconvened, and with a split in voting numbers, administrators found in favour of the club, allowing them to stay in business so long as they repaid their debts, which had now spiralled to £1.8 million, at 50p in the pound. Aswar Majid, who acquired a fleet of more than 30 vehicles, including Bentley's Lamborghinis and a £650,000 Ferrari Enzo, was found guilty of evading £750,000 in tax in 2009 and sentenced to three and a half years in prison. The judge described Aswar as having, quote, developed all of the qualities of a dishonest and manipulative rogue, end quote. Chaz, meanwhile, was sentenced to 10 years behind bars in 2021 after his complex £16 million scam built on smuggled alcohol and a network of fake businesses and forged paperwork was exposed by HMRC. Despite the Majid mayhem, a dangerous dice with death, and repeated points deductions in successive seasons, Crawley somehow managed to retain their conference status. And then came 2007 and the Steve Evans revolution. If you are unfamiliar with Steve Evans, congratulations for making it this far in life, but I'm about to ruin all of your hard work. Suffice to say, if Crawley wanted a quiet life after years of tumult, Evans was hardly the ideal candidate. He had spent seven out of the last nine years managing Boston United, with a two-year hiatus being the result of a 20-month suspension from the FA, owing to contract irregularities and false salary details in players' contracts. Evans later pleaded guilty in court to tax evasion as well, and was given a 12-month prison sentence, suspended for two years. Nonetheless, for all of his oddities, criminal offences, and accusations that his blood is more than 70% grease, Evans gets results, or at least, he certainly did at Crawley Town. In 2008, the club was taken over by Prospect Estates Holdings Limited and former owner John Julie, but they too didn't stick around for long. In 2010, not long after Crawley found themselves back in the High Court because of money owed to HMRC, Bruce Winfield and Susan Carter became the club's new majority shareholders, bringing real financial heft by non-league standards with them. Evans utilised Crawley's newfound riches by making some minor alterations to his first team squad. No, I am just kidding, he signed 23 new players over the next six months, making Todd Bowley look positively reserved within the transfer market. Crawley's arrivals included the likes of Matt Tubbs, Sergio Torres and Richard Brody, the latter reportedly for a record fee at non-league level. This was enormous investment, and it was reflected in Crawley's performances in the 2010-11 season, as they amassed a whopping 105 points and lost just three games all season, in addition to reaching the fifth round of the FA Cup, where they lost 1-0 against Manchester United at Old Trafford. Three weeks after the final game of the season, though, Crawley owner Bruce Winfield died. Crawley still managed to win promotion in their first ever season in the Football League and went on yet another FA Cup run, but in the summer of 2012, Steve Evans left to join Rotherham United, claiming to have taken Crawley as far as he could. When Evans departed, a video was leaked showing Crawley Town players celebrating, announcing that the fat man's gone and breaking out into song. The club released a statement apologising on behalf of the players and claiming that Crawley Town held Evans in the highest possible regard. It speaks volumes that this isn't even a top 10 crazy Crawley moment from the last couple of decades. 
Nor, it should be said, was the club banning a reporter from Crawley News because they didn't like some of his headlines, a decision which was condemned by 23 MPs in the United Kingdom. In 2015, Crawley were relegated from League One, and they finished between 12th and 20th in League Two in each of the next seven seasons. Before the WAGME consortium arrived, Crawley had been owned by Zaya Aaron, a Turkish businessman who made his money in steel, and twice served as the president of Turkish club Kayseri Ekesispor, who were closed down in 2018. Aaron hadn't inspired Crawley to any dizzying heights, but he had kept the club in League 2, maintaining relative financial stability, at least by Crawley's standards. The club still lost £7 million during that time, but virtually every team in the EFL loses money, and Crawley received regular, if not enormous, owner financing. Wagme made it clear that they wanted to compete in a different league though, both financially and indeed quite literally. The company, which was only created in January 2022 with an initial £1 share issued, had reportedly raised $18 million from investors by the time that they bought Crawley Town in April 2022. For the past five or six months, Wagme had been trying to acquire Bradford City, registering an official bid, but their takeover attempts proved to be unsuccessful. It's not exactly unusual in modern football for prospective foreign owners to be pretty non-monogamous when it comes to their interest in English clubs and to end up buying another one after failing to acquire their first, second, or even third preferences. And outside of clubs owned by lifelong supporters, fans ought to be well aware that their owners' interests in them are likely to be fleeting and primarily self-interested. Nonetheless, it can lead to a kind of suspicion which can be quickly forgotten if things get off to a good start. Unfortunately for Crawley Town, and for Wagme United, things couldn't have got off to a much worse start following their arrival. It was literally two weeks and two days after Wagme completed their takeover that Crawley were forced to suspend John Yems, their manager for the previous two and a half years, owing to what the club described as, quote, serious and credible accusations regarding the use of discriminatory language and Yems' behaviour towards players. The allegations against Yems could hardly have been more serious or shocking. It was alleged that he had called Crawley's ethnic minority players terrorists, suicide bombers and curry munchers, had operated racially segregated dressing rooms, and had used racially abusive language, including the N-word. Some of those claims were disputed. Crawley, for example, had two dressing rooms because neither could accommodate the full squad, and some players claimed that they were normally segregated by those involved in the first team squad and substitutes or those on the fringes of the first team, and that whilst, at times, they might have appeared to have been racially segregated for that reason, if a lot of white players happened to be starting games and a lot of non-white players benched, that wasn't the intention. Others, however, claimed that the segregation was explicitly racial and that Yems used to make comments such as don't change in the black boys' room to players to enforce the policy. In total, seven players registered serious complaints about Yems' language and behaviour with corroborating evidence and two weeks after his initial suspension, Crawley confirmed that they had mutually agreed to part ways with Yems. In July, Yems was charged by the FA with racial discrimination, and in January 2023, he was found guilty on 12 charges and banned from football for 18 months. Four out of the 16 charges initially brought by the FA were dropped, including the charge relating to segregated dressing rooms. Outrage at the length of Yems' ban, just 18 months, in relation to the severity of the charges that he had been found guilty of, led to the FA appealing against the decision. In April 2023, almost a year to the day from Yems' initial suspension, his ban was extended to January 2026, making it the longest suspension for discrimination in the history of English football. It wasn't an ideal start for Crawley Town's new owners, who hired bouncers to prevent fans from filming at their first supporters' Q&A session. Yems' assistant, Lewis Young, the younger brother of Everton fullback and former England international Ashley Young, took temporary charge of Crawley's first team until the end of the season. Three wins from seven games took Crawley from 13th when Yems was suspended to 12th by the end of the season. But as the season drew to a close, Crawley's owners had even more pressing concerns away from Broadfield Stadium. 
They bought Crawley in April 2022, and in May and June of 2022, the cryptocurrency and NFT markets crashed. Bitcoin, the largest digital currency, fell from a value of £35,000 on April 1st to just £15,500 by June 17th, losing over half of its value in less than three months. Several other coins were even harder hit. Ethereum fell by 70% over the same period, Litecoin and Dogecoin fell by 60%, and Terra fell by more than 99%, or 99.9999487% if you want to be specific. The NFT market, meanwhile, basically collapsed, as trading volumes fell by 97% from their peak in 2022 alone. Several major pieces of NFT artwork, including those owned by high-profile celebrity figures like Madonna, Eminem, and Neymar Jr., lost virtually all of their value. In some instances, fortunes that had been amassed in a fortnight were lost in a matter of minutes. And for those who had arrived at the least opportune moments, who typically had much less capacity to lose that kind of money than the likes of Madonna and Neymar, were particularly badly burnt. For a football club owned by a consortium of cryptocurrency and NFT investors, promising to make NFTs and Web3 technology a key component of their business model at Crawley Town, their head coach being outed as a massive racist, albeit not a conscious racist as far as the FA were concerned, and the crypto and NFT markets crashing within the first two months of their ownership, again, wasn't exactly an ideal start as well as their innovative ideas off the pitch, in terms of technology and generating revenue, Crawley's new owners had equally bold plans on it. They were very clear about wanting to play expansive, attacking, and possession-based football, and recruited as such. Lewis Young was seemingly never seriously considered as a permanent appointment, having only retired and moved into coaching after playing more than 200 games at Crawley in 2021, and Wagme went left field when it came to his replacement. Former Seychelles international Kevin Betsy, who made one Premier League appearance at Fulham at the start of the 2000s, had never worked in first team management prior to his appointment at Broadfield Stadium in 2022. Betsy joined the FA as a youth development coach in 2016, initially working with the under-16s before taking charge of the under-17s and under-18s over the next five years. With a growing reputation within the game, Betsy was poached by Arsenal's under-23s in 2021, where he was said to have impressed Per Mertesacker and Mikel Arteta during his debut campaign. Wagme were able to convince Betsy to leave the creature comforts of Arsenal behind and join Crawley in League Two, in what was a major risk for both parties. Betsy had firmly established himself in the youth team game as a progressive coach who played a fluid possession-based style of football, but implementing that with some of the most talented academy players in England in a development league is a bit different to doing it at Crawley in League Two. For Betsy, meanwhile, he was likely safe and sound for a number of years at Arsenal, with an emphasis on development as much as results, but failure to hit the ground running at Crawley would likely leave him out of the job, and with a flourishing reputation, lying in tatters in no time at all. Betsy wasn't always in agreement with Wagme on the way in which things should be done, but he was just as bold and willing to go out and bat for them in public. Like Wagme, he felt the way in which things have been done at Crawley up to that point were far too amateurish, and a throwback to the club's non-league days from a decade ago. Not content with dragging Crawley into the 2020s, Betsy looked to go beyond that. He began recording all of the club's training sessions using drones, so that they could be re-watched and analysed, with new members of Crawley's coaching staff taking their own individual training sessions. Innovative stuff by League 2 standards, meanwhile the tracking of players' hydration levels and finding them if they fail to provide urine samples prior to every single training session is a practice that isn't even adopted by those far above Crawley in the Football League pyramid. It's all seemed very modern, and in the transfer market, Wagme's much hyped data-driven strategy swung into action. Wagme aimed to make Crawley certainly the most data-focused club in League 2, if not throughout the entire EFL, and over the summer of 2022, they sold and signed virtually an entire new squad. 
Defender Mazida Gungbo, who Betsy had already worked with, was brought in on loan from Arsenal, along with fellow loanees David Robson, Alary Balcom, Teddy Jenks, Tom Fellows, and Caleb Chukwameka. A further 12 players were signed on a permanent basis, reportedly all on free transfers, including Newport County's Dom Telford, who was the top scorer in League 2 the previous season, with 25 goals. Crawley reportedly agreed to double Telford's wages at Newport before bonuses, signalling their intent. But it was the bonuses themselves that raised more eyebrows among players and agents than Crawley's spending in of itself. Recruiting players, at least in part, based upon stats and data, is no longer uncommon in football, but incentivising them based upon stats and data in their actual contracts certainly is. According to The Guardian, clauses were inserted into contracts awarding players with bonuses for winning headers and tackles. Crawley co-owner Preston Johnson stated, quote, We ultimately just wanted to have contracts that were incentivising players to work hard and play a way that we thought would be more efficient and conducive to us winning games. End quote. The decision to allow season tickets and exclusive Crawley Town NFT holders to vote on the club's transfer policies, such as in which positions the club should look to recruit over the summer, could also reasonably be described as, well, unorthodox. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, but after a promising pre-season campaign, Crawley Town fans tucked into a turd souffle with a side of rat piss. Just one win and six points from their opening 12 matches left Crawley bottom of the League 2 table when Betsy was sacked after two and a half months. Both owners and manager had taken a big risk, and things could hardly have gone much worse. Having been overlooked at the end of the previous season, Lewis Young found himself back in caretaker charge, and immediately results improved. Young won his first two games in charge, which was more than Crawley had won in the 12 games up to that point, and took 15 points from seven matches, only one of which ended in defeat. During that time, Crawley climbed from 24 to 19. Young felt that was enough to land him the job on a permanent basis, and when he was called into the owner's office, that is the conversation that he expected to have. Instead, he was told that former Premier League wide man Matthew Etherington, who had never worked in first team management before, other than in caretaker roles just like Young, was set to be appointed instead, and that he could return to his previous position. Unimpressed, Young quit, and he has since been appointed as a first team coach at Dagenham and Redbridge. It was another risk for Crawley, given Young's results, but based upon their statistical analysis of the team's performances during that time, they felt they had been fortunate to win as many points as they had, and that that good fortune wouldn't necessarily last or keep them in the division. It was a risk which, uh, you know, didn't exactly pay off, initially at least, as Etherington lasted just three games at Broadfield Stadium, one win and two defeats, before departing after barely a month. It was initially reported that Etherington had been sacked by Wagme, though the owners claimed that that wasn't the case, and that Etherington had walked out. There was a great deal of speculation as to why the former West Ham man quit Crawley so soon, much of it involving accusations of overreach on the part of Crawley's eccentric owners. Preston Johnson denied any suggestion that Etherington had been lent on with regard to team selection, or any other key decisions, outside of star centre-forward Tom Nichols. Considered by many to be the best player at the club at the time, Johnson stated that Nichols was too similar to Crawley's other options at centre-forward, and that given his age, wages, and market value, it made sense to sell him. Concerned at the prospect of Nichols getting injured on icy pitches in December, they therefore instructed Etherington that he wouldn't be available for selection. During the January transfer window, Nichols was sold much to the annoyance of many Crawley supporters, not just because they had lost one of their better players, but because Nichols joined Gillingham, one of Crawley's direct relegation rivals. There was a lot of anger directed towards the owners after Etherington walked out and Nichols was sold, none of which was helped by Preston Johnson flying over to the UK from the US and sitting in the Crawley dugout in their next game, a 3-1 defeat away at Stevenage. According to Stephen Edge's stadium announcer, Jake Drackford, who tweeted after the match, Johnson asked the fourth official at halftime how substitutes work, a claim which was denied by Johnson himself, 
who claimed that he didn't make any decisions from the sidelines and was there solely to provide moral support to Crawley's players after their manager walked out on them. Etherington's successor at Crawley Town was Scott Lindsay, who left 8th place Swindon Town to join them mid-season and is still the club's manager now. I know, for all of 8 months, it is hard to believe. Lindsay kept Crawley Town in League 2 last season, though only just, finishing 3 points above relegated Hartlepool United. The club went from 19th under Young and 20th when Lindsay arrived to 22nd by the end of the campaign, but survival was really all that mattered. Over the summer, Crawley moved their training ground from the home of non-league Horsham FC to the University of Sussex in Falmer, which is where Brighton trained before moving to a purpose-built training ground nine years ago. Wagme, likewise, wants to build a proper home and state-of-the-art training facility just for Crawley, but for now that will have to wait. The club has recruited goalkeeping, fitness and conditioning coaches, none of which Crawley had before their arrival, and all positive steps towards becoming a more professional outfit. Having Toby Brown, a member of the YouTube group The Sidemen training with their first team, along with two of his brothers, is perhaps less clearly a move in that direction. Kevin Betsy welcomed the move for the publicity and eyeballs that it brought the club, until the owners suggested that they were seriously evaluating the brothers' talents, considering offering them contracts, and that they could even be involved in Crawley's matchday squad against Accrington Stanley. Betsy distanced himself from those comments, emphasising that it was strictly a publicity stunt, but in February, Jed Brown, one of Toby's brothers, joined the club's B team on a one-year development contract. In the 2022-23 season, Crawley Town foregoed a traditional shirt sponsor in favour of displaying the Chromey Squiggle, a piece of digital art created by Snowfro, on the front of their shirts. The sleeves, however, were sponsored by XCAD, a platform which claims to reward users with creator tokens for watching their favourite YouTubers. Crawley's third kit, a black shirt created in partnership with Adidas, also sporting the chromey squiggle, was only made available to fans who also bought the Wagme United NFT. The Wagme United NFT currently costs 0.01 Ethereum, which at the time of this recording, and these things can change very quickly, is worth a little over $16. Johnson claimed that around 10,200 of the Crawley Town third shirts were sold, raising roughly $5 million or £4.1 million. That, presumably, means Wagme United NFT holders bought, on average, seven shirts each, given that according to OpenSea, where the NFT is listed, there are only 1,471 registered owners of the NFT as a whole. The average League 2 team generates roughly £5 million a season, so raising £4.1 million through the sale of an NFT-linked third shirt is significant. However, it is as yet unclear, assuming that Johnson's figures are even accurate, how much of that money has gone directly to Crawley and will be able to be reinvested in the club. It is reported that Adidas takes a cut from their role, and we know little about Crawley's financial situation since the takeover of the club, because they have twice shortened their accounting period, buying them two three-month extensions when it comes to publishing their accounts. Crawley are one of only two teams in League 2 who haven't yet published updated accounts in 2023, and for an ownership group that promised transparency when it arrived, it feeds into a general sentiment of scepticism and distrust. So too does the fact that, although Crawley Town have made a series of seemingly positive staff announcements, just as with their first team squad, the degree of turnover and general churn has been overwhelming. This summer, once again, Crawley signed 15 new players and sold, amongst others, League Two's former top scorer Dom Telford. The diminutive frontman failed to replicate his exploits at Newport in West Sussex and has since signed for Barrow. In January 2023, Crawley released a club statement which included the bizarre clarification that, contrary to rumours, First team players George Frankham, Jake Hessenthaler and Tony Craig hadn't actually been sacked. In the summer though, all three players departed. In the same statement, Crawley denied any suggestion that the club had broken financial fair play regulations and was due an imminent points deduction. 
the precarious nature of how Crawley's owners acquired their wealth, and some of their more unusual decisions since acquiring the club, hasn't always inspired confidence. Former Crawley investor Paul Hayward, who has been critical of Wagme's methods in the past, founded a company called AFC Crawley Town FC Limited with £10,000 of funding and the same listed address as the club themselves in February 2023. There was a suspicion amongst some fans that Hayward might have been preparing for the worst, namely a Phoenix club, should Wagme drive Crawley out of existence entirely. But he resigned as a director in July, leaving Irishman Michael Thomas Doherty as the club's sole director and person with significant control. Those are the negatives, or concerns shall we just say, and they are plentiful. But there have been some positives. Aside from greater revenue generation, which still remains to be seen in the club's unpublished accounts, Crawley have reduced ticket prices and crowds have increased. Crawley are one of the smallest clubs in the EFL by most metrics, and their average attendance is still the fifth lowest in League 2 at just 3,420 so far this season. It is a far cry from Wagme's first target, Bradford City, who averaged over 18,000 fans at their home games last season, and more than 14,000 so far this term. But it is still Crawley's highest average attendance since their League One days, and a more than 50% rise compared to just two seasons ago. Even more importantly, Crawley have made a promising start to the current campaign on the pitch. Despite being the bookies' favourites to be relegated pre-season, perhaps illustrative of the lack of trust in their owners, Crawley are currently 6th in League 2, having won 4 of their opening 8 matches, losing 2, and claiming 14 points overall. Just 4 points separates them and Tom Nichols' club Gillingham in 1st place, and they already have an 11 point gap over the bottom 3. What's more, Crawley are beginning to play the type of football that Wagme have promised, and aspired to since their arrival. In their last two games, a 3-2 win against Tranmere Rovers and a 4-1 thrashing of Newport County, Crawley have had 75 and 71% possession. No other team in English football's top four divisions has seen more of the ball in their last two fixtures. Most Crawley Town fans appreciate that the club is hardly a profit-generating machine, and that if they want to compete at or above League 2 level, they will have to find new or even novel ways of generating revenue. That is perfectly fine. The problem, however, aside from a broader and perfectly reasonable distrust of cryptocurrencies, NFTs, and particularly their staunchest advocates, is the blurring of the online world and promotion and the bread and butter of League 2 football. It is, in some ways, as simple as using members of the Sidemen for self-promotion, being shrewd on the part of Crawley, but suggesting that they could make your next matchday squad being patently absurd. Whether they will ever get that balance right, I would imagine that I'm not alone in having some concerns. Between Wagme's arrival in April 2022 and now, Crawley Town seem to have issued more statements than all of the world's banks combined, and supporters have now seen photographs of their corner flag from so many different angles that they know it better than members of their own families. Town Team Together is Crawley Town's official motto, but the reality is that the team themselves have barely been together for more than about five minutes in recent years. The togetherness and transparency promised by Wagme when they initially arrived hasn't materialised, and a series of bizarre decisions have eroded what little trust ever existed. There ought to be optimism surrounding Crawley's prospects this season, based upon improvements that they have made under Scott Lindsay and their start to the campaign. But in the long term, predicting the fate of Crawley Town is as dangerous, and as concerning, as a game as trying to predict the price of Bitcoin. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it, I sincerely hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and of course make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for both this channel, HITC7s, and also my second channel, Alfie Potts Armour, both of which should be on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram by the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so, and all of those links plus a whole lot more should be down in the video description below. Cheers.